The panel is uh, titled IS ISIL and Al-Qaeda's Core Organization After the Fall of the Caliphate. My name is Rayan El Amin. I'm the Assistant Director here at the Assam Fattis Institute. Uh, in this session, we're going to be getting into less of the ideological reasons why some of these organizations, and specifically ISIL and Al-Qaeda, had come about, and more uh, into the organizational structure, from what I understand, and uh, possibly the metamorphosis of the organizations uh, as far as their structure and leadership in this next session. Uh, we have uh, three great uh, interventions, uh, and I will just read a little bit of the biography of each one and uh, let them emphasize anything they want in their, in their talk. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Christoph Reuter, who is a foreign correspondent for the German news uh, magazine Der Spiegel. He has been reporting from the Islamic world for the past two decades. Uh, since 2011, he has been particularly focused on delivering news from inside Syria. His latest book is called Black Power and is about ISIL and its strategies. Our second speaker is Dr. Ann Stenerson, and she is a senior research fellow and director at FFI's Terrorism Research Group. Uh, she has recently been focused on Al-Qaeda's history, leadership, and strategies. Our third speaker, uh, Dr. <coughs> Hans Jacob Schindler, has a wide international experience in diplomacy and intelligence and security issues. Uh, prior, uh, Sh Dr. Schindler leads and coordinates the global work of monitoring team for both ISIL and Daesh. Uh, prior to his appointment, Dr. Schindler worked in security and consulting in, in the private sector. Uh, there's a lot more about their backgrounds and their experiences in the program, if you want to read more about uh, that. Uh, so with that, we'll just go ahead and get started so that we'll have enough time for discussions at the end. Mr. Christoph. Good. Is it on? Yeah. Why are we here? Why we dedicate conferences to Daesh? Because the Islamic State was able to conquer about 100,000 square kilometers of land to subjugate several million people and to maintain its self-declared caliphate for more than two years. For this rise, several factors were crucial. Propaganda or ideology was the marketing tool, helpful in recruiting foreigners and legitimizing the rule domestically. For its ability to conquer areas beyond its initial ground, which was Iraq, first to infiltrate, undermine, and subsequently to overrun them, other factors were essential. A highly disciplined apparatus and a strategic creativity to combine old elements of gapless control with new approaches, how first to acquire the knowledge of an unknown terrain, as northern Syria, or Libya after 2012. To administer the conquered areas, to provide food, fuel, justice, infrastructure to several million people for more than two years, it needed people with meticulous administrative understanding and skills. Finally, for its military successes and its differentiated operational procedures, it needed people with military experience as well as flexibility to react to different battlefield situations with completely different approaches. And last but not least, a core leadership which had no problems in temporary deals even with declared enemies. Only the composition of these elements enabled Daesh to succeed in the way the world was shocked to see in June 2014 and after. Also, the various elements of this composition will determine the future prospects of Daesh to emerge as an organization again, or not. Different than Al-Qaeda, for example, in Afghanistan or Yemen, Daesh's approach to power and control was totalitarian. Islamic State was their name, and they meant it, to govern and to control their proto-state. This habit of draconian punishments 
the atmosphere of spying and distrust, and the disappointment of foreigners who had been lured in by the persuasive propaganda led to deep disappointment. Only at the beginning, or in their relentless propaganda, Daesh had been friendly to its future subjects. Once they were under their control, it was all obey or die. No village or town we know, which was liberated from Daesh, seemed to be unhappy about the disappearance of Daula of the state. Thus, other than with Al-Qaeda, who didn't leave such a horrifying footprint behind, the return to power on the same path seems unlikely. Then there has been the aerial campaign by the US-led coalition, killing scores of rank and file fighters who are replaceable, but also of leaders up to the highest echelons. All five emirs who were leading the colonization of northern Syria are dead. In Iraq, the killing rate probably was similar, but we didn't follow it as closely as uh, in Syria. Most of these core leaders who were crucial in enabling the success of Daesh came from the former intelligence services of Saddam Hussein's apparatus. To replace them is difficult, since they initially had chosen a completely different career, biography. They had joined Daesh and its predecessor not because of ideological inclinations, but because of Paul Bremer's decree from May 2003 to disband the Iraqi army, all security, intelligence services, etc. It was a historical accident which Daesh itself cannot repeat. There were indications, intelligence reports, as early, early as 2017, that hundreds of elite fighters and some mid-level commanders were discreetly evacuated from the battlefields. Some were announced killed in action, although they hadn't actually been at the referred location where they allegedly died. Even for Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi himself, there were plans to evacuate him completely from Syria and Iraq to an inconspicuous safe haven as Sudan. Beyond his evacuation from Hawija area in January 2017, however, his whereabouts are unclear. He is suspected still to be in the desert of eastern Syria. In both countries, thousands of the foreign fighters alone are still missing, neither confirmed dead nor returned or in prison. But many more may lie under the rubble of Mosul or have been killed immediately after capture. Some more may be in Kobani prison. When we look at the whereabouts of IS personnel in Syria and Iraq, we find interesting cases. And this is where I start with this little map. Um, I'll go to talk about, um, where, where is it here, about Hawija, uh, about the escape from Raqqa and the resurfacing of about 400 uh, Daesh fighters um, in northern Hama and southern Idlib. And will not go into detail, but it is important to keep in mind, there is the area near Halabja, where Ansar al-Islam, the um, kind of Al-Qaeda outlet organization until 2003, was governing a small terrain in the mountains around the small towns of Bayara, Khormal, Tawila. And according to reports we have is that people are trickling back into this area and building up jihadi structures there as well. And the remnants of Ansar al-Islam merged with uh, Daesh, so this could be another hotspot. But coming to the, the cases I want to talk about, there is the deal. The Kurdish-led uh, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, basically PKK, Öcalan control, struck with Daesh in Raqqa in early October 2017. To avoid further losses of their own forces, the Kurds agreed to let several hundred Daesh fighters, including their families, altogether about 4,000 persons, to leave. As investigated by the BBC, they left Raqqa under the eyes of US forces, taking as much weapons and ammunition with them that several vehicles collapsed under the load. Um, Ah, this is, sorry. <laughs> uh, the gray areas you have here are 
allegedly areas where you still have a strong presence of ISIS um, families, fighters who escaped from Mayadeen and other areas, or other towns, basically. Um, <clears throat> and this is the way the evacuation from Raqqa took. Um, after having moved out of uh, Raqqa and into uh, Daesh controlled terrain, the convoy split. Some moved south to Mayadeen, which at that point was still uh, under Daesh control at the Euphrates Valley. Some moved in other areas of the valley. Many moved to Turkey, hiring local smugglers or using the well established Daesh smuggling network to get into Turkey. And one group was brought through territory under control of uh, Assad's forces to regroup and reappear again in the area of northern Hama in southern Idlib months later, uh, near the villages Um al Khalakhil, Al Khwain, Al Kabir, very small villages where there had been no ISIS presence since uh, early 2014. There, they suddenly took up the fight against various Syrian rebel groups, including Hayat Tahrir Shah, the former Nusra, Zengi, and others. And then on February 13, 2018, they all suddenly gave up and surrendered to the rebels. Ah, there you have them. Um, according to three of them we were able to talk to, they had been brought by uh, Assad's forces to this area, which would explain why they suddenly emerged in a kind of bubble within regime territory. Um, they had been provide up with weapons, ammunition, and supplies. According to two of them, the deal was that they would conquer Khan Shekhon, a little bit further north. They failed, were unfamiliar with the terrain, and thus they were cut off from all supplies and quickly surrendered. For the demise of Islamic State on the Iraqi terrain, events took a similar path. After the liberation of Mosul, was announced even several times by Prime Minister Abadi. The liberation of Hawija, the last densely populated stronghold, was hardly mentioned at all. Within two, three days, the troops of the Iraqi army and the so-called Hashid al-Shabi, the popular mobilization units, the Shiite militias, basically rolled through this difficult terrain with about 100 villages <clears throat> and didn't try to clean the area, really to hold it. So they met little resistance except for the main town of Havija itself. 700 to 2,000 fighters mostly melted away. A lot of them, including commanders, faced an even more comfortable deal than their comrades in Raqqa with Masoud's, Barzani's, Kurdish Peshmerga forces in the north. According to witnesses and Iraqi media who reported about it, but obviously accurately, they got a deal to hand themselves in, including all weaponry they could carry. They looked relieved, according to people who saw them surrendering to Asaish, the Kurdish intelligence forces. For which purpose Bazani wants to retain an ISIS force, we can only speculate. But the reason why the Iraqi army moved on so quickly probably had to do with it. To take back Kirkuk, the multi-ethnic city Barzani formally wanted to annex with his referendum for Kurdish independence in late September including disputed territories, including Kirkuk. It seems the Islamic State now has outlived its relevance in northern Iraq. When I came to Hawija in December, I found a nightmarish setting. The Dawaj hadn't disappeared completely. They had gone into hiding in the marshes along Tigris and Zab River, in the bushlands, the surrounding desert, and each night they would come back, uh, this is for later, Oh, okay. Each night, um, they would come back to terrorize to kill the villagers. The cases in both countries reflect how the war against Daesh was superimposed by other factors, as to use this fight to position the own force, force favorably for the hour zero after defeat of Daesh, as the Kurds did, or to use Daesh as a proxy force to be used with plausible deniability against other enemies, as Assad's forces do. We have to take into consideration that the priorities there have shifted very quickly. Having said so, the chances of a full-fledged return of Daesh in the same shape are slim. Daesh's consistent strategy to bet on ultimate control of the subjects instead of their approval 
worked well as long as Daesh was in command. Once they lost, there is little loyalty. Individual fighters have been absorbed by a variety of other groups as Hayat Tahrir Sham and Idlib. We have about seven cases of German-born fighters alone. Um, the Syrian Democratic Forces in the north who happily took 14, 15, 16-year-old fighters and told them you can be rehabilitated if you fight with us now. Small groups have surfaced in Libya, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, but rather with the intention to bail themselves out instead of starting a new underground network. More worrying, but not my subject here, is the arrival of allegedly several hundred men in Afghanistan and Pakistan, where they could find unspent recruiting grounds also in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. But for Syria, and particularly for Iraq, there looms another risk. Daesh left behind destroyed cities, scorched earth in Raqqa and in Mosul, and metaphorically, even in Hawija. They have killed so many people there that the families of the victims demand revenge, expulsion even of the families of the Dawash. The picture here you see is how the houses of the Dawash families get destroyed. Legally, there is no reason, but tribal traditions tend to extend their responsibility to relatives as well. Sheikhs, they are desperate. Either they agree to deport thousands of mothers' children to camps and to breed a new generation of Daesh to zero, or they let them stay and risk feuds which will rip apart their communities. Not to mention the recent fear that Daesh still is able to kill people whom they consider their enemies. And what you see here is um, houses of Daesh families burning in a village in northern Hawija. From the earliest days of Abu Musab al zakawi and his killing spree against Iraqi Shiites, the investment in hate and retribution has been a strategic constant for the Islamic State. Its monstrous appearance enabled the rise of the Shiite militias in Iraq, who as well have deported, kidnapped, killed Sunni men all over central Iraq, raised villages down to knee level. We had problems to find some of these villages last spring, um, because simply the vegetation was higher than what had remained of villages. Dar's calculation has been a simple one. Shiite reprisals would drive Sunnis directly into the arms of the Islamic State. And that is exactly what happened in 2014. In Mosul, Tikrit, and elsewhere, many Sunnis welcomed the Daesh invaders as liberators. To sum it up, the apparatus of the Islamic State, which is ingenuity, its discipline, creativity, and its resources seems to be gone. As long as we don't know if Daesh will be able to restructure itself with the few remaining old leaders or has grown enough mid-level commanders to the same level, it's unlikely that they can return in its old force and shape. And the appeal, at least to locals, Daesh governed, has been exhausted by the brutality. But the seeds of further division, confessional hate and dysfunctional governments have been planted extremely successfully. Thus, the fertile ground is there for resurrection, but how it will look like if there will be a new brand essence, if they will reappear as a more nationalistic movement, or if they will stay completely in the underground where they have moved much more professionally in the years before 2013-14, remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Ann will be next. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I have been asked uh, to speak about the Al-Qaeda core and, uh, its, and how it has changed basically since 2011, the start of the Arab Spring, and as a result of bin Laden's death. Uh, to start with, um, a picture of the overall organization of Al-Qaeda. Um, I don't think that the overall structure of the network has actually changed much. And by that I mean uh, Al-Qaeda is still comprised of a core leadership uh, led by Zawahiri uh, and various regional affiliates. 
And as we can see on this map, which is taken from an article by Bruce Hoffman, um, published recently, uh, Al-Qaeda still has considerable support uh, across Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Uh, at least there is support for the idea of Al-Qaeda. I'm not saying that these numbers actually reflect the number of Al-Qaeda uh, Al Al fighters. That's a kind of problematic, <laughs> uh, problematic uh, statement uh, to make, but it reflects general support for the idea of Al-Qaeda. And then these affiliates have, as we know, more or less close ties to the Al-Qaeda core or Al-Qaeda central. Uh, and although there has been some internal fragmentation of Al-Qaeda affiliates since 2011, uh, the general impression is that Al-Zawahiri is still the undisputed leader of Al-Qaeda, at least for now. Uh, and the basic structure of the organization with the core and affiliates model that has basically been uh, the structure of Al-Qaeda since 2003 uh, is still, uh, still the same. However, I think there are some important changes uh, in Al-Qaeda's strategy and focus. And this is the topic for my speech today. Basically, my presentation has two main takeaways. First of all, Al-Qaeda has changed its geographic focus away from the Afghanistan-Pakistan area and to the Middle East. That's the first one. Uh, and secondly, uh, Al-Qaeda has adapted its strategy of international terrorism. I'm not saying it has abandoned it. I mean, there are some that would argue that. I don't think it has abandoned it. Uh, but it has changed the way it conducts international terrorist strikes from a top-down to a sort of bottom-up or inspired uh, approach. Um, so before elaborating on these two points, let me just um, briefly uh, explain the background for why I think, uh, or what is it that causes Al-Qaeda uh, to change its strategy. Uh, and I'm making the fundamental uh, assumption, uh, and it is that Al-Qaeda's strategy is, first of all, reactive, and secondly, it's opportunistic. That's the two basic factors that causes Al-Qaeda to change its strategy. Uh, it uh, reacts to pressure, and it uh, seizes opportunities. Uh, and you might disagree with that. You know, it has been said after uh, Zawahiri became leader of Al-Qaeda that, you know, now Al-Qaeda will change strategy into a more Zawahiri type of strategy. Uh, I don't really believe in that. Uh, I think uh, Zawahiri has very much continued the strategic directions that were given by bin Laden uh, all the way up until bin Laden's death in 2011. And that includes uh, the current Al-Qaeda approach of focusing on revolutions in the Middle East. I mean, that's not an idea that was invented by Zawahiri. It's very much also an idea that was uh, promoted by bin Laden, especially after the start of the Arab Spring. Uh, so with regards to the pressures and opportunities for Al-Qaeda, I take a 10-year perspective here, as you say. Uh, I find it very hard to focus only on 2011. Like, I don't think there's a distinct, different Al-Qaeda before and after 2011. I think Al-Qaeda continuously changes and adapts, including to events like the Arab Spring, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, and there are three events in particular I want to emphasize. It's the US drone campaign uh, in Pakistan from 2008 that intensified 2008. That impacted Al-Qaeda's strategy. Uh, and then the Arab Spring uprisings created opportunities that Al-Qaeda obviously wanted to seize. Uh, and third, the rise of ISIS also created a challenge that Zawahiri had to respond to. Let me start with the drone strikes. As you can see from the statistics, there was a drastic increase in drone strikes against Al-Qaeda mid-level and high-level leaders, especially in the tribal areas of Pakistan. <coughs> Started in 2008 under the Bush, uh, last half uh, year of the Bush administration and continued uh, increasing under the Obama administration. Uh, we see here there was a lot of drone strikes in Pakistan and then from 2011, uh, the US also started using this strategy extensively uh, in Yemen. Also other places, that's not included in these statistics. So the main impact of the drone campaign, uh, uh, I argue, is that it weakened Al-Qaeda's core organization in the Fatah. 
in the Afpak region, but especially in Fatah in Waziristan. Um, and this is part of the background for why Al-Qaeda from 2009 started to move core functions of its, uh, of its central leadership structure to the Middle East. Uh, and the first thing that happened and that we all observed was Al-Qaeda moved its external operations um, branch or external operations activity. Uh, by external operations, I mean international terrorist attacks. Uh, that's what Al-Qaeda calls, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's what Al-Qaeda calls its, you know, uh, the, the cell that organizes terrorist attacks against the West uh, is called the external operations cell or branch in Al-Qaeda. That was moved, uh, as we know, uh, to Yemen uh, around 2000, well, I believe after 2009, uh, Saleh al-Sumali was killed uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Fatah. Saleh al-Sumali was responsible for the external operations back then. He was a very important figure, involved in a number of terrorist plots against Europe and the United States. So he was killed in 2009, and after that, there wasn't really many candidates left. Uh, but uh, as, as we know, uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen took up, took up that challenge, with Awlaki being uh, one of the main, uh, main individuals behind that, and also al the leader, the later leader of AQAP. Uh, so, the uh, anyway, the drone strikes is one thing that very much impacted Al-Qaeda, and it's also very visible in Al-Qaeda's internal communications from around 2009, 10, and 11. Uh, bin Laden is very concerned about uh, the threat to Al-Qaeda members in Fatah, and of course he's uh, seeing that one after the other, these senior Al-Qaeda leaders are killed in drone strikes, and he encourages them to move out of Fatah and to move elsewhere. So if we go back to these three factors, uh, the second event that impacted Al-Qaeda's strategy uh, was the so-called Arab Spring, uh, the Arab uprisings, which started in Tunisia in December 2010. Uh, the main impact of the Arab Spring on Al-Qaeda, uh, and this is not, perhaps not very well known, but it actually boosted bin Laden's self-confidence. Uh, it convinced bin Laden that Al-Qaeda's uh, strategy uh, was working, you know, he, he uh, interpreted the Arab Spring as uh, a sign that the United States was losing its grip on the Middle East because these Arab dictators were falling. Mubarak in Egypt was falling. Bin Laden previously viewed, you know, uh, who is upholding Mubarak's power? It is the United States, was the, the core thesis of Al-Qaeda. That's why Al-Qaeda first wanted to attack the far enemy before taking on the near enemies and so on. So Bin Laden, before his death, uh, he, he, uh, uh, he experienced the start of the Arab Spring, and it was very much a topic in his internal communications between December 2010 and uh, up until uh, his death in May 2011. Uh, and he wrote about this uh, Arab Spring as being an historical opportunity for the jihadi movement to establish a base in the heart of the Muslim world, basically. And this made uh, Al-Qaeda uh, turn its attention and resources, in my opinion, away from Pakistan and towards, again, towards the Middle East. And the third major event that had an impact on Al-Qaeda was, uh, of course, the rise of ISIS. Um, and I think the rise of ISIS uh, was both a challenge and an opportunity uh, for Al-Qaeda, if we are to be cynical. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it was a challenge because it created a rift in the global jihadi movement, obviously. Uh, but it was also an opportunity because uh, it uh, made, uh, it gave Al-Qaeda the chance to appear as normal or appear as the moderate and sensible part in the face of ISIS brutality. Uh, it created a so-called radical flank effect, which is known from the social movement literature. Uh, when a really brutal actor uh, rises on the flank of a movement, it sort of uh, is beneficial for the more 
moderate uh, parts of the movement, uh, moderate in, uh, that's relative, relatively speaking, of course. Uh, but Al-Qaeda seized this opportunity and played on it in its propaganda. Zawahiri very much in his statements after, uh, after 2013 very much emphasizes the moderate pragmatism of Al-Qaeda as opposed to ISIS brutality and uh, un-Islamic actions. And after Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda has of course, uh, well, has been known to emphasize a so-called population-centric approach to insurgencies in the Middle East. And Rakis, um, that's of course not anything that's new after 2011. I mean, that's been Al-Qaeda's sort of method all along. It's to, you know, Al-Qaeda back in the mid 2000s also criticized uh, Zarqawi for killing Shia Muslims, for killing, uh, s killing civilian Muslims in Iraq, you know. Uh, and especially after the failure of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, you know, after the Anbar awakening and, and, uh, and the US surge in Iraq, uh, bin Laden was very concerned with uh, that Al-Qaeda must not repeat the mistakes of AQI, of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And it's very apparent in bin Laden's communications with Yemen in 2009-2010 that uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or Al-Qaeda in Yemen must not <coughs> Uh, alienate the tribes of Yemen. That's his direction. Whether Al-Qaeda in Yemen actually followed those directions, that's a, different, uh, that's a different question. I think we will hear more about that tomorrow. Um, but my point is, um, looking at these macro events, you know, uh, we see that there's no definite shift in Al-Qaeda before or after 2011, at least not when we talk about the overall strategy of the movement. It's rather a um, change of direction that happened over time, happened over the past uh, 10 years, and that was reinforced by events after 2011, especially the Arab Spring. Uh, I'm now going to talk about the implications of these strategy changes. Let me start with the uh, uh, change of geographic focus, which was the first uh, change I wanted to mention. Uh, Al-Qaeda has changed its geographic focus from Afpak, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and to the Middle East. Specifically today, Al-Qaeda is very much focused on Syria, of course, as we've heard. Um, and of course, you might disagree to this. You might think that, well, Al-Qaeda still thinks it's relevant to fight in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Al-Qaeda still has its branch on the in Indian subcontinent and so on. And I'm going to talk more about that uh, <coughs> shortly. Let me just explain why, why I'm saying that Al-Qaeda changed focus. Uh, and it's based on these four observations that you see here. First of all, Al-Qaeda moved its external operations or international terrorist attack ability, let's say, from Afghanistan to Pak, from uh, Afpak to Yemen in around 2009, 2010. And then afterwards, when it was also hit hard in Yemen by the US drones, moved to Syria briefly before it was also decimated there. Um, today, it's unknown what that capability actually is. I'll come back to that as well. Um, there's an interesting document found in bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, where he speaks to his deputy, uh, Sheikh Atiyah, uh, who was also killed later in 2011. Uh, but there is one letter where he orders uh, Atiyah to uh, focus less on Afghanistan, Pakistan, specifically just leave Afghanistan, Pakistan up to the lower level commanders <coughs> and, and start focusing on the Arab Spring. This is part of the collection of letters where bin Laden talks about the Arab Spring and what Al -Qaeda should, uh, how Al Qaeda should position itself in relation to the Arab Spring. And he orders specifically his deputy, who is a very uh, high-ranking level, uh, high-ranking uh, leader in Al Qaeda at that time, uh, to change focus to the mi Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and that's a change. That's a definite, uh, uh, definite sign, I believe, that Al Qaeda is changing focus. It's not just you know saying that it is. It's actually 
uh, allocating important resources away from AFPAC and to uh, Middle East region. A few other observations uh, is that Al-Qaeda moved the number two position out of the AFPAC in 2013. Uh, that was, of course, related to the fact that in 2012, uh, Abu Yahya Alibi uh, was killed uh, in Fatah, and he was sort of the, the last candidate who was qualified for that position in that region. So that's why Al-Wuhaishi, uh, the leader of uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, uh, became appointed as the general deputy of Al-Qaeda, that is, the, the deputy of uh, bin Laden. And after al-Wuhaishi, uh, the position apparently went to uh, Abu Khair al-Masri uh, in Syria, uh, who held that until he was killed also in 2017. And my last point is about, what about uh, Al-Qaeda on the Indian subcontinent, you know? Um, my interpretation of the establishment of AQIS in 2014 is that it actually represents an outsourcing. Al-Qaeda outsourced the jihad uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan to a Pakistani guy, Asim Umar, who became the leader of AQIS. And as I said, you might disagree with that, but I'm going to elaborate a bit. On what does this shift in geographical focus mean for Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan? I put up some uh, points here, uh, what, I view, uh, what I look upon as important uh, you know, factors that influences Al-Qaeda's standing, uh, first in Afghanistan and then in Pakistan. We'll also talk about the Islamic State in Khorasan province here and Al-Qaeda's relationship to them. Uh, first of all, Al-Qaeda's prospects for uh, Afghanistan today, I believe, is, are bad. I mean, they are worse than they were in the period 2001 to about 2000, yeah, at least 2006. 2001, 2006, uh, Al-Qaeda had uh, much more activities, I think, in Afghanistan than what they had now. Uh, Today, there are Al-Qaeda members still in Afghanistan, but they don't have, they, they're not involved in organized military activities like they were uh, before. Uh, this is related to the fact that some Al-Qaeda leaders were shifted from Afghanistan to Iraq, uh, especially Abu, uh, uh, sorry, especially Abdul Hadi al-Araki, who was Al-Qaeda's military commander in Afghanistan. He left around 2006 to go to Iraq, and he was arrested on the way and sent to Guantanamo. Uh, but that was also, um, that's also an indication that Al-Qaeda back then th found, I think, the U Iraqi battlefield much more important than the Afghanistan battlefield. <coughs> anyway, so um, today I think Al-Qaeda's prospects in Afghanistan are not as good as you might think. <laughs> I think they're much worse than they've been for a long time. First of all, you have the Islamic State in Khorasan, which is an organization we briefly heard about, which is uh, quite strong at the moment, at least in some parts of eastern Afghanistan, and that is currently challenging the Taliban. The ISKP is, uh, uh, is in regular militant clashes with the Taliban, with the local Taliban groups uh, in eastern Afghanistan. Uh, Al-Qaeda, as far as I know, does not have a relationship to the ISKP at all. Of course, ISKP being a part of Islamic State conglomerate, Al-Qaeda uh, traditionally supporting the Taliban. Uh, Al-Qaeda wouldn't consider supporting the ISKP. If anything, Al-Qaeda would continue to support uh, the Taliban, who has traditional sort of uh, authority among the insurgents, among the Islamist insurgents in Afghanistan. Uh, but Taliban is also changing. Uh, after many years of insurgency, uh, certain parts of the Taliban today are leaning towards political uh, solution to the conflict. There have always been elements in the Taliban that have been opposed to bin Laden. Of course, they existed also before 2001, but they didn't have any political power. 
whereas today, uh, with Mullah Omar uh, who, uh, dead, and with more uh, heterogeneous uh, or uh, yeah, more splits in the Taliban than previously. Uh, I think these camps in the Taliban who uh, oppose Al-Qaeda uh, and who are willing to distance themselves from Al-Qaeda, they're more powerful uh, than ever before. And this is also negative for Al-Qaeda's future prospects in Afghanistan. The way I see Al-Qaeda future in Afghanistan most likely is that, of course, Afghanistan will continue to provide sanctuary for individual Al-Qaeda members, and it will continue to provide uh, possibly also areas for training camps. It does not have so much to do with who's in charge in Afghanistan. It has more to do with the geography and nature of Afghanistan, Afghanistan being a not a centrally controlled state with lots of opportunities, lots of ungoverned areas, lots of valleys where all kind of members could hide and nobody would ever even know. So that's about Afghanistan. Very shortly about Al Qaeda's prospects in Pakistan. Uh, in Pakistan, um, there have been several effective counterterrorism operations against Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda allies, such as the ta Pakistani Taliban, Tehrik Taliban Pakistan, um, over the past several years. Uh, and that's negative to Al Qaeda. Uh, Al Qaeda prospects in in Pakistan. It's interesting that uh, Pakistani Taliban, who was an Al Qaeda, a strong Al Qaeda ally um, in the mid 2000s, uh, Pakistani Taliban had great success around 2007, 2008. I mean, it was established as an organization in 2007. Uh, had popular support after the siege of the Red Mosque in Islamabad in 2007. But, and it expanded considerably in both in the tribal areas and in the KPK province uh, uh, in, uh, in North Pakistan on the border to Afghanistan. Uh, and that success, however, that turned into popular backlash uh, because of various terrorist attacks carried out by Pakistani Taliban or in the name of Pakistani Taliban. Uh, <coughs> despite that, we know that there's a, a huge radical Islamist networks still, uh, still in Pakistan. Al-Qaeda on the Indian subcontinent is one of those groups, but the way I see the status of AQIs today is that it seem, seems absorbed into local networks. The operations of AQIS are very localized in nature, except the, you know, the very first operations when they launched AQIS in 2014. They attempted a spectacular attack in Karachi that failed. Almost, I mean, would have been spectacular if it had succeeded. Uh, but uh, AQIS has not become what Al-Qaeda intended it to be, is my, uh, is my uh, assessment. The general implication of all this is that Zawahiri is becoming more and more isolated from the rest of the Al-Qaeda network. Uh, because, uh, 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 well, it's based on my assumption that he's still based in Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, of course. Uh, we don't know that for sure. <coughs> but uh, he's clearly not in control. <coughs> of the situation uh, with the various Al-Qaeda groups uh, in Syria, for example. Yeah, let me just go quickly now, because I think I'm yeah. out of time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not, I won't have time to talk about the international terrorism that much. Um, let me just state that Al-Qaeda's ability to stage top-down organized international terrorist attacks has been uh, considerably decimated because of the U.S. strong campaign. I mean, it's a direct result of that. That's the way I see it, because the leaders have been killed one after the other. Uh, to compensate, Al-Qaeda has developed a strategy of what they call Al-Jihad Al-Fardi, individual jihad, uh, where Al-Qaeda functions as an instigator of attacks in their propaganda, but 
it's up to the Muslims living in the West to take responsibility for themselves, as Zawahiri said in one of his uh, speeches. 2011 was the first speech he issued as the new Al-Qaeda leader, by the way. The implications of this, let's call it, well, it's often called lone wolf terrorism. I don't like that expression, but this bottom-up approach to international terrorism. It's a low-cost way for Al-Qaeda to continue pressure on the US and Europe. Uh, it leads to less deadly attacks, more amateurish attacks, but it's nevertheless terrorism is terrorism uh, in any case. It doesn't take much to create insecurity and concern in Western countries. Uh, the third point here, it's, yeah, uh, I should explain briefly that ISIS uh, stole the European attack networks from Al Qaeda in 2014. That's a provocative statement, maybe it directly contradicting uh, Guido's statement in the past panel. I think that the European militant Islamists, they don't really, many of them don't really care if they're in Al-Qaeda or ISIS. They kind of follow whoever is most successful at the time. Uh, so I think that these militant Islamist environments in Europe, at least the ones I looked most at, the British and the Belgian and the French, uh, they could switch back and forth, that's what I think. Um, in the future, uh, Al-Qaeda will also attempt to rebuild its external operations branch. I think that's necessary if Al-Qaeda is going to carry out a new spectacular, economically damaging uh, terrorist attack. They have to do that through a centralized, uh, a centralized strategy, top-down strategy. I don't think that just comes out of the blue. Um, but my summary is, Al-Qaeda core, I think we should look at it as a reactive, opportunistic organization, not so much steered by the personal preferences of Zawahiri or whoever is leader, but more, uh, it's, a, it's an organization that existed for 30 years, and uh, it always goes where the opportunities are. That's why Al-Qaeda is in Syria now. Uh, that's why it, it might go to Afghanistan or Pakistan in the future if opportunity arises, but because of the developments I have mentioned, I do not think that's a prospect uh, in, at least not in the near future. So Al I think Al-Qaeda has refocused on the Middle East and it's going to do so for quite some time based on the opportunities in the Middle East right now. Al-Qaeda as an organization is weaker now than it was in 2011 but the ideological support is still strong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Schindler is next. Thank you very much also from my side for the opportunity to speak today. I mean, the advantage of being the last panelist in the panel before lunch is that you have an absolute justification to be brief and um, I will try to do this as much as possible. I, I will orient the, my remarks on the, on the questions that were very helpfully sent beforehand uh, and it uh, uh, has uh, four parts. First, I will look at ISIS and Al-Qaeda potential convergence, the discussion that I started with Guido publicly uh, in the last panel. Then look at the administration of offshots. Uh, um, third, I'll look at particular offshots, administration, Al-Qaeda core, relationship with HDS and AQAP, and then ISIL in Libya, Egypt, and the Af Af Afpak region. Uh, and then because I just came out of the advisory position at the United Nations Security Council, you have to bear with me. I have to mention the sanctions regime as a tool of global counterterrorism. It's just simply that's what I get paid for. Um, so ISIL and Al-Qaeda potential convergence. So we have heard a lot this morning and in the last few presentations about the restructuring of ISIL uh, after the military defeats in Iraq and in Syria. The result of this restructuring clearly is an organization which has flat hierarchies in which groups, networks and cells act increasingly autonomously on a global scale. Um, in my assessment and assessment of the monitoring team, uh, this network looks a lot like the Al-Qaeda network in a structural sense. Therefore, the questions of convergence has to be twofold, strategic and tactically. 
Obviously, as we heard this morning, there is quite serious differences in, on the ideological ground on the strategic level between both organizations. Um, the question that I, however, pose from a counterterrorism perspective is how meaningful those differences are for the individual fighters that I'm concerned as a major source of threat. So obviously leadership questions like Baghdadi versus Savahiri, targeting far enemy priority or the everyone, as ISIL has stated, caliphate now or caliphate as the project for the next generation. Um, the recruitment process, anyone worth this, a strict vetting selection of, of individuals for specific attacks were some of the differences that were clearly visible in a practical sense between both organizations. In, however, in the current situation, the differences are no longer as important uh, uh, as they used to be as far as fighters uh, are concerned. Several examples of, uh, in which ISIL and al-Qaeda fighters cooperated <laughs> tactically in the last year and a half uh, or in the last two years are, are clearly uh, demonstrating this. Number one, uh, the two Paris attacks, Charlie Hebdo and then a year later again the attacks. Um, if you look at the facilitators, the networks look very, very similar and the individuals are at times identical. Um, there is an attack in Nairobi where a cell um, of uh, Southern Europeans who had radicalized in, in London uh, split up part joined ISIL, part joined Al-Shabaab, and there was money flowing between Syria and that cell in Nairobi to prepare attack at the same time as Shabaab already started killing. Um, uh, uh, ISIL uh, uh, fighters in Somalia, i.e. showing that the network is held by personal uh, relationships rather than what the two brands are doing to each other. And then, of course, the Yemen example, I know Guido doesn't like it, but I have to mention it, is where, where there is transition uh, between fighters, between both groups. Therefore, um, there are, uh, as I said, transition of fighters in certain regions, ISIL in Afghanistan and Pakistan, happily accepts fighters from the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or TTP in its ranks, but also the TTP and Al-Qaeda uh, except fighters from ISIL, Afghanistan, Pakistan, back into its ranks. Um, in other regions, there is fairly good coexistence. Um, we have the example of Boko Haram, um, where it fell into two at least factions. Both tried to um, both tried to declare a loyalty to to ISIL, um, but are operating right next to the new coalition of EQAM. We have Murabitun falling into one wing. Uh, still uh, uh, loyal to Al-Qaeda, the other being uh, loyal to ISIL, and there is no fighting between them. The last remaining conflict after Syria um, that we can see on a global scale where there is active fighting of Al-Qaeda affiliate against an ISIL affiliate is within Somalia, where Al-Shabaab tries um, to eliminate the around 400 fighters of the Darut clan that fo followed Abdul Qadir Mumin um, into declaring loyalty for ISIL. Consequently, as outlined in the team's latest report from January and then the, the Secretary General report in January as well, there is a potential convergence of both networks, at least in a tactical sense, in two potential scenarios. A global division between ISIL and where in some regions where Al-Qaeda is clearly the stronger affiliate, like in Yemen and Somalia, ISIL may no longer invest enough to keep its affiliates there. And in others where Al-Qaeda is equal, uh, like in West Africa or in uh, Southeast Asia, where we have two branches of Abu Sayyaf, one loyal to ISIL, one loyal to Al-Qaeda. They may simply coexist, and only in a few regions um, ISIL was ever stronger, I Iraq and Syria, that's no longer the case, um, as well as in Egypt. Therefore, the second scenario, um, what, what uh, Guido has called the, the global fizzling away of, of the cohesiveness of the movement is something that we see in the long run where uh, the networks of individuals then may follow a completely new ideological trend um, or those networks may combine. But we see this as a long-term trend uh, um, which we don't assume to be happening quite soon. So the administration of offshots. This question depends on what time frame one looks at. Um, obviously, ISIL at the height of its caliphate, and I'll take this as the framework 2014, maximum 2016, had clear connections and communications with some of its new offshots, uh, including clearly regular financial support. Good examples here 
uh, ISIL in Libya, on which I will expand a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, ISIL court regularly sent em emissaries, including media teams, sent financing, including finances for Beit al Maqdis in the Sinai Peninsula, and sent fighters back deliberately about 500 Libyan returnees in 2014. With ISIL Afghanistan, Pakistan, this group would not exist had it not be for a delegation of, uh, from ISIL Corps from Iraq and Syria that came to Afghanistan and um, uh, tried to establish this network. And until re very recently, ISIL sent financial support, sometimes quite, fundament uh, quite substantial. There was a seizure of 1.1 million US dollars um, that the Afghan security forces did in 2016 um, that was transferred clearly and that was uh, uh, clear from the banking and Havala transactions from Ira uh, ISIL in Iraq and uh, uh, Syria. Um, then we have ISIL in West Africa, as I said, Boko Haram and Al Murabitun. These are quite independent, so the, the impetus came from the offshot on the ground itself to declare loyalty and then ISIL simply accepted that they got some support on the media front, as far as we know, but there is certainly not uh, any close connection in the way it was with Libya or with Afghanistan. Um, with the military defeats of ISIL Corps in Iraq and Syria, and this is the question of the time frame, the control and the support for the affiliates at the moment is questionable. Uh, ISIL Corps propaganda, of course, still plays a key role in keeping the brand intact and the global messaging intact. But uh, there is really no indication for at least the last eight months of any regular operational command and control um, of ISIL Corps or of any of its affiliates, as far as we can see. Um, ISIL, uh, since 2016, ISIL Corps has transferred significant amount of monies out of Syria and Iraq, as mentioned this morning, one presentation, um, and bunkered it outside the conflict zones. Now the question is then, what is the long-term use of those sums? Um, who had been, as far as we understand, invested uh, after being laundered, invested in, in, uh, in the economy, i.e. those funds continue to gen generate profits. Now, ISIL course management of the offshores, as we just heard, and I completely controlled, um, uh, and, and I completely uh, agree, the command control over the affiliates is always rather tenuous in recent years. Um, I uh, had, uh, with the team, look at, of course, at the Abu Dhabat papers, and it seemed to us that it demonstrated, of course, a tactical interest of UBL. He wanted to know what's going on in the different affiliates, but it does not seem the documents, to our uh, uh, assessment, demonstrate enough day-to-day -day operational control to actually talk about Al-Qaeda core leading those affiliates. Um, currently, as outlined, Al-Qaeda core primarily seems to play a branding role via public statements and speeches. Um, as we will see in my next part, um, even the connection to the Syrian affiliate se seems to be waning at this moment. So, control over specific offshots, Al-Qaeda core, HTS, and AQAP. Let me start with AQAP. Over the last few years, AQAP has and continues to be uh, the one, um, if not the uh, absolute, most innovative Al-Qaeda affiliate. If you look at the IED designs um, that were developed in Yemen, we've seen them in other conflict zones. Obviously, we already had on one of the slides the propaganda ma magazine Inspire, which predates Dabik or Rumia, i.e. this was the innovative uh, thing to, of the use of the internet and internet magazines, and then Dabik or Rumia simply took it to the next level. Um, and uh, in the last year, um, clearly, uh, the uh, IQAP propaganda outlet, in, including Inspire, seems to become a somewhat inofficial Al Qaeda core outlet because important interviews were done within that magazine, um, um, uh, strategic interviews, as far as the future of Al Qaeda is concerned. Control over territory um, um, was primarily uh, tried out for the first time since 2001 by Al Qaeda AQAP in Yemen with mixed results. Um, and in a learning curve, uh, the second time they tried with Mukalla, where they demonstrated clearly that they learned from the mistakes of 2010. But question how much uh, uh, control Al-Qaeda core had over AQAP since it's been squeezed for quite a long time uh, 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 in the Afghan-Pakistan border regions over AQAP operationally. And we could not establish that there's an operational control there. HTS or JTS or JAN, uh, again here comes the question of what time frame you look at and on how this 
connection was clearly Al Qaeda core from the beginning understood the importance of having a successful affiliate in the Syrian conflict. Um, there was a quite a lot of communication in emissaries traveling bet uh, between Syria and uh, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan uh, in the early days when it was still Jabhat al-Nusra. But the situation, uh, the changing situation in particular since 2015 and 16 that forced uh, uh, al-Nusra to look at potential coalitions with other groups within Syria um, seemed to also mean that um, the control over HDS by al-Qaeda core um, seems to slip. So the first renaming was still agreed a mutual, uh, as far as we understand, a mutual uh, uh, made agreement between some key al-Qaeda leaders and, and Jolani. The second renaming certainly was no longer. Um, therefore, HTS remains internally divided between the majority uh, of fighters and leaders who prior, uh, prioritize a local agenda and a minority that wants to pursue, uh, continue to pursue and see itself as part of the international agenda. Uh, and see Syria as potential springboard for the future. Um, the Al-Qaeda affiliation of, of al-Nusra as part of HTS is and continues to be a hindrance um, for the necessary local alliances that the group has to build in order to survive politically and militarily. Um, now let me look at ISIL course management of the uh, 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 affiliates in uh, Libya, Egypt, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, as outlined before. The control of ISIL core over those, um, over those, um, dependent on how they were generated. Um, in Libya, ISIL uh, uh, core was actively engaged um, in creating the affiliate, um, sending fighters, sending money, sending uh, specialists to make sure that uh, uh, operations, at least in Sirt, went uh, uh, according to plan and not like Derna. Um, in ISIL in Egypt, uh, uh, in the Sinai, Ansar Bed al Maktis, um, that declared loyalty in 2014, um, here, of course, this was an important strategic victory for ISIL core and uh, its affiliate, all, uh, and, and it supported the affiliate via Libya. Um, with money, uh, seeing it as a linchpin, but we have not seen any operational instructions between ISIL core and uh, um, its, its affiliate in, um, in the Sinai Peninsula in the way that we saw that with Libya. Now, I'll finish because I'm running out of time and uh, I promised I would bore you at the end of this with the sanction regime as a tool. Um, clearly, the fight against ISIL now has to concentrate on a complex networks of fighters, sympathizers, returnees, relocators, i.e. people going from one conflict zones to the other, as well as a growing group in, in several states of frustrated travelers, those who would have gone to a conflict zone, but because of the efforts of the international community to prevent the travel of, of radicals, um, have to stay home. Um, the geographical power center in Iraq and Syria no longer exists for ISIL. Um, therefore, we need to transit the counterterrorism fight with a heavy, that had a heavy focus on military actions to more classic methods of counterterrorism on a global scale, unfortunately. Um, as already outlined uh, in the speech at the very beginning this morning, um, there are F, uh, foreign terrorist fighters from over 100 member states. So that means pretty much the entire international community. This is the particular exacerbated, but what we see on a tactical level, the convergence of fighters uh, from Al-Qaeda and ISIL networks for particular attacks. Um, therefore, the ISIL-Al-Qaeda sanctions regime is the, one of the global instruments that can be used to counter uh, uh, this threat. The sanctions list includes currently 270 plus key individuals around the world, uh, plus 80 uh, plus uh, entities um, from around the world, all affiliated with ISIL-Al-Qaeda. Uh, against those, we have a global travel ban, a global asset freeze, and a global arms embargo, meaning no travel, no money, no arms. Um, and it's globally mandatory to be implemented by all member states. The list, therefore, has two core functions that can be useful. Number one, entities um, that mark, demarcate a political ballpark. This, and only this, is ISIL al-Qaeda terrorism. Anything else, uh, governments, of course, are free to pursue, but they would have to make a case why this is a particular terrorist group. Um, secondly, it has an operational aspect with the individuals. You can target, in particular, facilitators, and the regime has increasingly done this till 2014, as far as money transfers are concerned, as far as weapons transfers are concerned, and hinder their ability to operate. Um, since 
um, these individuals are dependent on having a bank account at one point or the other to pay for things or being able to travel internationally via the aviation system, both of which can be quite successfully prevented via this regime. It also allows, as a regime itself, the adjustment of global counter-terrorism uh, counter measures. And if you look at the flurry of resolutions, this, it, the regime has passed from regulating um, the travel of foreign terrorist fighters and the criminalization of those in 2014 with Resolution 2178 to revamping the global arts and antiqu antiquities market in 2347-2347. Uh, um, uh, of last year, and then very recently another resolution on FTFs. There are about 29 different ones in between. I'm not going to bore you with those. Therefore, it's a flexible instrument on a global scale um, to use state capabilities and to guide cap uh, state capabilities to counter, in particular, networks and facilitators, uh, uh, and most effectively, uh, uh, financial flows of terrorist organizations. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, look forward to your questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and take some comments, questions. Uh, please keep them brief. Identify yourself before you speak. And uh, probably running over about 15 minutes into, so we'll have about half an hour. Does that sound OK for our Q&A? We'll start right over here. We'll take three questions uh, before we go back to the speakers. Hi, my name is Mona Alami. I'm an unresident fellow with the Atlantic Council. My, questions, uh, my question is um, actually addressed to Dr. Ann and Dr. Hans. Uh, I'd like to know your, your opinion about um, Ansarid, uh, the new Al-Qaeda formation, which is a coalition formed of Jaish al-Badia, Jaish al-Malahim, and Jaish al-Sa'ad al-Hal, uh, din in Syria. What type of future do you see for this particular group? And we know that uh, individually, the heads of uh, the three formations all pledged allegiance to Al Qaeda. So there's a clear Al Qaeda affiliation with these groups. Thanks. Right over here. This is Iman Argab from Al Ahram Center for Political and Strategic Studies in Egypt. Uh, I have a question regarding the future of ISIL and Al Qaeda. Um, given uh, the, the scenario that Taliban is developing in a way or another, where they decided to, to go through negotiations with the United States and to be open to political solutions, as you already po pointed. Do you think that ISIL and Al-Qaeda may follow the steps of Taliban in one uh, uh, phase of their development or not? Thank you. Floor's open, right over here. Professor Assamani. I was listening very carefully to Madame Anne, Mr. Jacobson, and uh, Mr. Reuter. Uh, I have a question. Why every time that uh, we see that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are ready to surrender, we always see somebody coming and helping them? They were in the north of Iraq when the Iraqi army and the Syrian army came to fight them, they were brought away to Turkey or other countries. Why that? If really you want to fight them, as you say, Mr. Schindler. Thank you. OK, we'll go ahead to maybe Dr. Schindler can start, and then we can come across. Right, so, so let me start with the Taliban development. I mean, that's one, one part where I'm not quite in 100% agreement with, uh, with uh, my, my previous speaker here on the panel. Um, I don't see there is a clear development of the Taliban towards negotiations. So what happened with the transition from Mansur to Haibatullah, in our view, was that the tent got bigger, but the walls got stronger, i.e. under Mansur, um, you had a credible uh, leader that had enough political uh, power um, to actually go for negotiations and, and signaled as such. Um, that, however, led to an, an offspring of, of several sprinter groups from the Taliban movement. So now after the death from Haib uh, of, of Mansour, Haibatullah, who is fairly weak, doesn't really have an entire uh, uh, internal power base, happens to be from the wrong tribe of the um, of the uh, Afghan in, in the south, um, uh, uh, has not the ability to force the movement to do anything. What he was 
able to do because of his weakness was to bring those splinter groups back into the fold of the Taliban. But we have not seen a clear indication that the Taliban are going to go uh, um, towards negotiations anytime soon at this point. Um, if anything, the, the two most violent years in, in, in Afghanistan just lay behind us, um, the indications are <coughs> quite to the contrary as far as negotiations is concerned. Um, but obviously, obviously, everyone hopes that they will in, in the future. The why Al-Qaeda and ISIL will not follow the Taliban is simply because the question is different for the Taliban. For the Taliban, it was always about establishing a, a Islamic emirate within Afghanistan, and they've been extremely consistently clear since their creation that that's the goal. Afghanistan and Afghanistan only, not the region, not the world. While Al-Qaeda and ISIL at the very core, and, and please for my amateurish... Uh, 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 for my amateurish characterization here, are a, um, a project that completely rejects the, the, the international structure and the national system, including um, um, uh, nation state structures and international uh, legal structures. So there, 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 there is no negotiation partner on the other side that they would be uh, 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 recognizing as legitimate, even if the international community, which it doesn't justifiably, would wish to negotiate with them. Um, why ISIL and Al-Qaeda always gets help when they're ready to surrender? Now, I was part of our operations in Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002. I can tell you, no one helped them. Um, uh, uh, what was happening to them in Afghanistan was certainly uh, a clear indication of, of uh, no one really being ready to help them. Um, what happened uh, in Raqqa with those fighters is still a big question mark. And, and who negotiated what and agreed to what um, is, is a, a really interesting uh, thing to look at. Um, um, but I'm not privy to, to the details of the information of what it happened exactly. But the, clearly, there was this convoy of the fighters leaving with their equipment. I mean, there is no, no way to deny that. Um, so why this was done at that particular point, uh, I'm, I, really not, I really don't know. Maybe uh, you have an idea better than me. All right. well, the point is, since you referred maybe to what uh, I had said, it's not that foreign powers come to rescue Daesh in the last minute. It's much more that Daesh has been useful to the Syrian regime long, long time under a different name since 2003-04, when through Syria all the jihadis were basically received, carried, partly trained, and sent to Iraq to blow themselves up there. So you have kind of working relations dating back pre-revolution. It's a, uh, they're kind of useful enemies to each other. At the end, both think uh, they will annihilate the other. But in the meantime, they share the enemy to fight the rebels, for example, who are more digestible to the international community than Daesh would be. Um, so what we saw in Idlib was one case, but uh, luckily rather easy to prove that the regime has been using Daesh uh, for a long time. And what we saw in Iraq is that simply the fight against ISIS was never something on top of the agenda and the most essential thing to do, but it was something you could follow different objections, objectives with. You could incre increase your territory, as the Kurds did. Um, you could have a coalition which would immediately fall apart once the main enemy is gone. And what we saw in Kirkuk, uh, it took days, basically, after Hawija was at least officially liberated, and Kurds with German Milan missiles were shooting the Iraqi army and vice versa. Um, so in this ocean of conflicts, Daesh was one factor, but once they are not relevant anymore, immediately it's reshuffled. And either you take parts of the group as a proxy force to be stored somewhere, or you simply ignore the risk of returning, or you ignore the risk of the feuds which will uh, come up, emerge in the areas um, they had to leave. Yes, let me just comment on the <clears throat> question on Al-Qaeda in West Africa, uh, the coalition established there. Um, I think uh, Al-Qaeda in West Africa definitely has a future be uh, simply because it's uh, been there for a long time, not necessarily calling themselves Al-Qaeda, but uh, uh, there are all these local, uh, locally based dis uh, disenfranchised local population and uh, uh, 
Uh, many of them uh, attracted to Al-Qaeda ideology, and this is a development we've also seen in other parts of the Muslim world. Uh, I'm not an expert specifically on Africa, so I won't uh, make any specific predictions, just uh, seeing uh, Western North Africa as a potential region where Al-Qaeda will continue to be strong. Uh, that also has to do with the opportunities that that region offers uh, in terms of uh, areas not controlled by central governments. With regards to the um, Taliban negotiations and whether Al-Qaeda or ISIL will follow in their steps, uh, I think, uh, well, there's of course an ideological difference between ISKP and Al-Qaeda on one side and Taliban on the other. So on a leadership level, I do not see that at all. However, uh, it's important also, it's important uh, I think to study or to understand uh, ISKP, not just as a branch of Islamic State Central, but actually as an uh, organization that recruits locally, very much recruits from local disgruntled tribes in the Nangahar province. And these local populations that uh, support ISKP now, I think many of them are opportunistic. Many of them have a grievance. That's why they support ISKP. Uh, that might be simple, uh, conflicts over land, conflict over smuggling routes and resources. Uh, so I think the ISKP uh, in many ways has a local face that's important and that can be won over to uh, negotiations or whatever uh, to, can be turned ideologically. I don't think ideology is that important on the lower level. I, I do agree that Habib Abdullah is a person, uh, he hasn't shown any indication of wanting to negotiate at this point. I also see him as a Taliban leader that's a bit of the same category as Mullah Omar, who was also from a minority tribe and didn't have that traditional uh, influence, um, uh, um, network-based power, but he did have that religious charisma and uh, Mullah Omar had that certainly more than Habib Abdullah today, and uh, that's why I see potential for fractions, uh, fracturing of the Taliban movement uh, today. Thanks. We'll take uh, one more round of hands, and we'll come back to the speakers. We'll start right over here. Sorry. Okay. So Sorry. Let me come back to that afterwards. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was very curious about uh, after the fall of Raqqa and uh, the explanation that you gave of the caravan that exited and fighters who were able to sort of melt in or be co-opted in other areas. Are we talking primarily here about local fighters and Arab fighters, or do you have any indication that this also included some of the foreign fighters? So for my particular interest, um, I know there, were, there was a large contingent of ethnic Kazakhs and ethnic Tajiks in Raqqa, and we're not sure what's happened to them exactly. Um, we know in other places, like in Mosul, many of the times they were left behind and they were unable to blend into the population, and oftentimes reporting indicates that they were, they were executed in revenge killings. Uh, but it looks like um, it looks like the Kazakhs and the Tajiks who were in Raqqa may have survived. I'm interested if they were in this convoy. Uh, Good. We, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the floor is open. We'll take a couple of more questions. So if you have a question, ask it now. Go ahead right here, and then we'll come back to the speakers. Um, hi, I'm Nanuk from the Belgian Embassy. Um, thank you for the panel speakers. I have a small question for um, Dr. Ann Stanerson. So when you were talking about the changes of Al-Qaeda, that their strategy was changing from top down to bottom up, you uh, said that there was an increase of lone wolf terrorism, and you said that you didn't like the term of lone wolf terrorism, and I was just wondering why. Hmm. Any more questions? Okay, we'll go back to the speakers, and uh, we'll wrap it up with the speakers. If you wanna start maybe, Anne, and then. Yes. Um, 
Um, well, the term is descriptive in a sense, and I use it because it, you, you sort of immediately know what I'm talking about. Uh, for researchers, uh, we don't <laughs> sort of like it because it's uh, a bit misleading. Uh, you know, when you say a lone wolf, you think of somebody who gets radicalized in, their, uh, uh, in, in front of the computer in complete isolation. Uh, I mean, it's that picture that uh, I, I don't uh, want to promote by, by saying lone wolf, because uh, when we look at these cases of uh, individuals who carried out attacks in Europe, very few of them are actually self-radicalized, you know, uh, purely online radicalized. It's very few cases. Uh, most of them have friends and family uh, and contacts into, uh, into the radical networks uh, in Europe, uh, radical networks of different kinds, from community organizations to uh, yeah, individuals from uh, former foreign fighters and so on. So what I mean uh, is that these, these guys are not alone. You know, they have some kind of uh, interaction with, uh, with the environment around them uh, and that has that's important because it has implications for how you counter this you know you don't it's not necessarily uh, the only solution is not necessarily to stop the internet propaganda you know because you have these environments on the ground that's also uh, still very important interesting question because we have we know about a few French. We know about a few Germans, although not all Germans, who were kind of vetted to join Hayat Tahrir Sham came from Raqqa. Um, but we don't know yet, at least, about Kazakh and Tajik. The overall majority of those who could get out were Syrians and Iraqis. Um, but there is one of these gray areas um, east of the Azor in the desert. This is kind of unexplored terrain. You have a lot of people who went there. And for example, the UN didn't report a huge wave of refugees when the regime took Mayadeen. Um, but through aerial reconnaissance, they know that there are a lot of small informal encampments in the desert. Um, they even uh, send cross-border supplies from Iraq. But they say, we don't know who these people are. So it could be for the poorest who have no chance to blend into Turkish population, who are not part of the rather expensive smuggling network for the higher leaders. Uh, and if they don't want it to keep on fighting, they might be in the desert or dead. Um, but simply, we don't know yet, but we hope to talk to more of the 400 who have been captured in Idlib. It takes a while. Dr. Schindler, if you want to have a last comment. On the, on the identities of the people having uh, left Raqqa, I really have nothing to contribute. I simply don't have enough information to, to make a, a sound assessment. I got rumors who they were, but I mean, rumors are not good enough to, to make a statement. Please help me thank all of our panelists today, and we'll have lunch now.